Thank you all for coming and for staying. I really do appreciate it. What is a 74-year-old who had just finished his first half century as, a, as an academic? All right, I graduated from law school, Northwestern, 1965. So it was a half century ago, and I was starting my second half century. I might not make it to the second half. I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> But I thank you all for coming. What am I doing taking an overnight train from Chicago to talk? Well, I have great respect for the New York Party. I really do. I know some of you. David Duman is a wonderful man. I've known him for years. And he read my book. And I appreciate people who read my book. And Craig did a wonderful interview of me. The presidential candidates got a full hour interview. And Craig was just marvelous. And I remember Jeff, and of course, my old friend Karen, who was wearing my button. I know she's for Jill, which is fine, but uh, <laughs> she's wearing my button today, which is a nice little tip of the hat. So thank you all. In the fall of 1979, 35 years ago, I said, the United States government no longer functions properly. I see something that I'm going to call, and people were just beginning to call, gridlock. Okay? You've heard that term. I used the term in the beginning of a United States Senate campaign in the fall of 1979. This government no longer works. It needs constitutional, probably some subconstitutional also, but it needs constitutional change. This 18th century document, which was the creation of a small group of landed white males, is not only out of date. I mean, that's a long argument, but it's out of date, believe me, okay? But it is also biased. In other words, if it were out of date, but somehow by accident fell kind of in the center of the spectrum, I wouldn't be quite as angry. It's out of date to the advantage of the political right. Okay? Now remember both those things, please. Okay? So what do you do about it? You hold a political campaign. I ran against Ernest F. Hollings, Fritz Hollings, remember it's Senator of South Carolina. Fritz and I have become great friends. I'm the only person who's run against Fritz Hollings twice. I ran against him in the New Hampshire primary, 1984. <laughs> Funny story there that we don't have time for. Fritz saw me and, he, oh my God, it's you again. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I've been at this for 35 years. I have great respect for Jill Stein. I have great respect for what she's doing. I 99% agree with her. I'm not real fond of Richard K. Wolf, but that's another matter. Basically, what she's doing is fine, and she's doing a hell of a job of talking about contemporary issues, topical stuff, and she's right, 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 all the way down. I'm an academic. I have a very abstract mind. My publications, nine books, speeches that I've made and campaigns that I've run all have a very theoretical base. We don't have time for all this. It has to do with cognitive structures and uh, how institutions look at things. I once wrote a book called um, The 21st Century Left, Cognitions in the Constitution and Why Buckley is Wrong. This was Buckley versus Vallejo which, remember, was the, was the forerunner court, uh, case, and I was attacking it. And, of course, I kind of thought, well, you know, you start with that, but someday it's going to even get worse. And guess what? Citizens United. But I wrote, as I say, a, a very nice review, and we sold 107 books because it was just too abstract for most people. People looked at it and said, my God, what a cognition in the Constitution. Well, I think they're very important, but it is very theoretical. In the year 2000, I entered the South Carolina presidential primary. Molly Ivins wrote about me, and I, I uh, engaged in civil disobedience. 
I told the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, to put it where the moon don't shine on several of their requirements for filing. And I said, I am not going to do that. And if you want to bring a case, here I am, OK? They demurred. They didn't want a case with me. And it's not because I'm such a tough guy. It's just that I was right. And I had a series of arguments that were ready to go into a, a US district court and say, this is how bad the Federal Election Commission is. It's a wholly corrupt institution that is the protector of a wholly corrupt political institution. OK? They didn't want any of that. They didn't want any of me. But we did do something back in that first campaign, 1980, running against Fritz. I was able to get some wonderful, wonderful publicity, the TRB column in the New Republic. This is uh, something from the Christian Science Monitor. It was something from the Washington Post, which I don't have a copy of. We got publicity because what I asked for was to use the constitutional bicentennial in 1987, excuse me, 1987, okay, to have a citizens group that would look at the Constitution and make recommendations to update and, uh, the Constitution and make it more fair. We got an A-list group of people. It was chaired by a man named Lloyd Cutler, who was counsel to the president in the Carter administration. Um, Bill Fulbright was there, C. Douglas Dillon, Nancy Kassebaum, uh, wonderful senators, former senators, governors, Academics, James McGregor Burns from Williams College. I'm sure some of you have read his writings. Uh, and we met for two years. And we submitted our recommendations to the president and to the Congress. How to improve the American political system. That's the math head for that. OK? What was the reaction of the president and the Congress to this blue ribbon citizens group that recommended changes in the Constitution. That's correct. Silence. <laughs> okay, you got it right. All right. Absolute silence. Reagan privately told Cutler that he would endorse the four year House term, which was one of the things that we recommended. There's no more anti-majoritarian provision in the Constitution than the two-year term, because what happens is a much smaller electorate that is opposed to the president goes in and whatever. If you didn't get it done in the first two years, and in practical matter, it's like six months. But you know, if you didn't get it done right away, you ain't going to get it done. OK? So the will of the people is immediately negated with the two-year term. Look at the bozos that we're dealing with. The Senate's bad enough, but look at the House of Representatives today. I mean, look at those people. Uh, whether, you, whether you like Obama or, 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 or dislike him still, I mean, this is not what a president deserves. So anyway, that's who I am. That's why I'm doing this. I don't think that Jill is quite as comfortable talking about it, which is fine. It's kind of a division of labor here. I can go around and talk about this. I hope to get a few votes at the convention. Jill's going to win. I just want people to begin to think about this. And I'm telling you, you're entitled to think about the system as a political issue. OK, I know we have all these contempt for the wars and the uh, mass incarcerations and the uh, distributions of income and wealth and all that. There are just so many contemporary problems, and that's what you hear every day in the news and on Facebook and so forth. I'm a, pro I'm a college professor, again, of an abstract bent, and what I'm saying to you is shut that out for at least some of the time and say, how did we get into this mess? You know, how did we get to the point that we're you know, not functioning at all and what can we do? So I don't want to go here, uh, in, into great length here. I do believe that the four-year term would help us greatly. I also believe, and it was one of the recommendations uh, of our group, to change section six of article one with regard to 
not just separation of power. See, we have two things, and a lot of people only see one. We have separation of power. Everybody understands that. We also have separation of people. If you're in the Congress, you cannot serve in the executive branch. There is no bridge in the American government. There is no bridge between the legislative and the executive branches, okay? So one of the things that we talked about at great length was, wouldn't it be good if some of the committee chairs, let's say, of the House and Senate also had cabinet or sub-cabinet positions? You see where we're going. You see where we're going. I'm going to ask a very simple question. You all know the answer to it, but you've never thought of it, maybe. Give yourself a continuum, a, spe a spectrum. Centrifugal, okay, out from the center. Centripetal. What are the centripetal governments in the world today? Well, you can come to North Korea, Zimbabwe, the Central African Republic. Yeah, we can all come up with that. What is the most centrifugal government on the planet. What system is the most decentralized of all the political systems of the 200 odd national governments on the entire planet? What's the answer? Us. Us. You remember uh, Ben Johnson, you know? Uh, Boswell's like, uh, Life of Johnson, you know? It's not that the dog walks so awk awkwardly, it's that he can walk at all. Remember? <laughs> Remember that line from, from, from Johnson? That's really true. We have the most. We have separation of powers, we have federalism, we have bicameralism with the two houses being equal in, in, in power. Staggered elections, that's one you don't think about, but that's a very anti-majoritarian thing. Well, you only get to vote for some of the government. And we got this other group over here, and they'll see that you don't get what you want, you know? This was deliberately anti-majoritarian, okay? And then again, this separation of people thing, and we have a system that was designed not to work. You've all read Madison's number 10 Federalist, haven't you? You all know Madison's number 10. He want the government to work. Let's see, he says so right in there. No majoritarianism. You don't want people aggregating and willing something to be public policy and pushing it through the government. We don't do that in this country, says James Madison. And I like Jill, I am nothing personal against Jill, but I haven't heard her mention James Madison yet. I mentioned James Madison in my lectures, okay? Because unless we change this government into something that is more majoritarian, more centripetal. Now let me just say before I close here, every once in a while somebody says, well, we just ought to go to a European parliamentary system. I have always said, you know, we're such a diverse country, it's a large country, 321 million people now, you know, uh, that it would, be, it would be difficult to do here. But that is the last resort, okay? Don't forget it. That's the last resort. You just start over, okay? You say, okay, now we have the British parliamentary system, okay? And if they don't like these incremental changes that this very thoughtful group worked on and that I've campaigned on in several campaigns and have written about it in several books, there is okay, you get European parliamentary government, and there'll be one of the parties will probably be socialist, and they'll even win occasionally. Look at Scandinavia. Look at how, look how the Scandinavian governments work compared to our, I mean, it's not even, you don't have to be a political science professor to, to figure that out, okay? So that's what we're talking about here, and I, I don't really wanna say too much more I appreciate this opportunity. There are a couple things you can do for me. One is that you can send me an email, billcremel at gmail.com, and give me one sentence that says, I approve of Bill Kreml as a Green Party presidential candidate. You have to have 100 signatures. You do it all, all by email, okay? Billcremel at gmail.com. 
one sentence that you approve of me as a presidential candidate helps, helps me get out. Okay? I have some buttons. People want buttons. I've never turned down a contribution. Um, I didn't come here, you know, to make, make money. Uh, but if anybody wants to contribute, that would be great. Uh, Bill Kremel for president. And I do have the book. This is my ninth, and I promised my wife, final book. Okay? Because uh, I do the work, she does the aggravation. <laughs> you know? Okay. But this is a summary of some theoretical positions that I think support the kinds of changes I'm talking about, but also talk about the changes in much greater detail than I've been able to here. So that's why somebody who's 74 years old, who's patriotic in the best sense of the word, uh, I love my country, even to the point that I don't want our soldiers going over to, to Iraq and Afghanistan. We've all had this drilled. I enlisted in the Army the 3rd of February, 1959, 56 and a half years ago. I was wearing the uniform, okay? Brown boots, we still had the World War II boots, okay? So that's how long, you know, I've been a, a patriotic person, I guess. I'm an active member of the Sons of Union veterans. My great-grandfather was shot by the Confederates, 1864, and I, I'm a member of a very fine group of, of people who are not right-wing yahoos. Actually, most of the people in, in my camp, at least, the Sons of Union veterans, are very anti-war. We have, we have uh, studied the Civil War, and there's a lot of vainglorious crap with the flags and all that. It was a terrible, terrible thing, and what my great-grandfather went through. It. Okay, question time. You're oh my goodness, hey, I'm going to need a hall monitor here. But I'm going to start with you and just go right down. Yes, sir. So I had two questions about your ideas. Um, the the, the four-year house term, yeah. um, would that be, or do you care whether it would be every four years the whole house or would it be- Every four years the whole house, house, house concurrent with the presidency. Okay. See, so you elect a president and the house. You still keep the staggering for the Senate. Okay, and that's a little bit of a guarantee of going too far. But uh, you'd have to have a sentence in there which said, if you decide to run for the Senate in the middle term, you would have to leave because the Senate would never vote for it otherwise. Yeah, go ahead. The other question is, uh, the idea of, of moving away from the separation of functions, um, you know, there's, there's certainly structural things you could do, but there are probably things that are just in our thought patterns that could be done immediately. Like, for instance, congressional oversight could be turned into, into more of a board of directors kind of concept. Yeah. Um, so w where there'd be a lot more cooperation between the branches, even if there wasn't a formal. I fully agree with you. There's only one problem, that you're talking about human beings. You know, one of the few things in, in Madison's number 10 is that marvelous expression, if men were angels. Mm -hmm. Remember that from number 10? And it's true. You know, if, if men were angels, we'd, you know, we could give them all the power and, you know. Um, so that, that's my, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side, but, you know, there are those kind of considerations. Thanks a lot. Yes, you were. You. Um, I, I understand how structural changes can prevent corruption in certain ways. Right. But how does, and I understand in certain, like, proportional representation kind of, you know, but I'm, my question is, how do you, stop corporate control of the government with even with these changes? I, I was talking here only at the constitutional level. Right. You're absolutely right. Proportional representation, public funding, uh, at least instant runoff voting, if not approval voting, you know, all those kinds of things. I'm in favor of, of that. I really am. I, I have no problem with the, with the Green Party platform. And yes, there are sub-constitutional things that would have to be done as well. That's true. Yes, sir. Um, did your commission, or do you have a view on um, Supreme Court reforms, particularly um, term limits rather than lifetime appointments or election <laughs> rather than appointment of? I had a great time with Craig when we did our interview because I, I, I have an idea on, on, on term limits. I have term limits for the corporations. You know, 
You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you went down to Wilmington, Delaware, and you looked at the GE corporate charter to find Thomas Edison's uh, signature, you know? All right? You have these bastards that we can't touch, and nobody's touched them. I'm talking Jamie Dimian. I'm talking uh, Maurice Blank Fine, Kevin Lewis, all right? All this kind of stuff. These guys, the government can't touch them. The one thing you can do is have term limits for the corporations. And if you're doing this stuff, then you don't get a charter when it comes to. Okay, now I haven't completely answered your question. I'm just kind of an ancillary thing. I have mixed feelings about this with the court, okay? Because I remember, all of, you know, I've read so much, and, and Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., you know, was just an extraordinary figure. And what was he, 92 or something? He was still on, it's still, still, still pretty sharp. Um, these contests for um, the, the, the two-thirds vote for the approval of Supreme Court nominees now has become more and more political. You know that. It used to be that the president made a good faith to the Senate, you know, unless there was some moral turpitude or something. Now this has become extremely uh, contentious. That's my only reservation about it. Uh, yeah, there are some guys on the Supreme Court that I would like, you know, give them, give them a little wave. But um, then you're going to have battles. You're going to have nasty battles. And as everybody knows, and we talk about this in the Green Party all the time, the, the thing we have to fight is, well, if you don't vote for Hillary, you know, you got four old guys on the, you know, uh, I shouldn't say four old guys, uh, Justice, Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg is a, is, is, is not in good health, and, and she's, what, 83 or something like that. And so you're going to have more of that. That, that. That's the only thing on the other side, okay? You're going to have more and more appointment fights. You know. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I've read that one of the biggest contributors to gridlock is that there are so many points of veto within the system. That's so correct. it's so much easier to veto at something or to object to something that nothing actually ever gets done. It's like designed to fail. That's exactly right. And you know who wrote about that early on? Was Ted Lowy. Chaired professor, Cornell University, right down the Erie Canal here almost. Okay? Right. Okay? Yeah. What did Ted Lowy do in the year 2000? Anybody know? He was on Ralph Nader's steering committee. He was on Ralph Nader's steering committee. And he wrote a book called The End of Liberalism. And it was veto points and what he called access points, how the interest group gets it. You don't have to buy the whole government, okay? You just have to buy the, the, the committee chair in your area or the regulatory agency chair, you know? And when you have a highly centrifugal system, there are so many access points. And then they became, in his term also, captive agencies. So look at the F FDA and all of these kinds of things. They're basically working, you know, for the, for the private sector side. Yeah, yeah. Sir. Um, you talked about your difference with uh, Jill Stein. It sounded like it was a 1% difference. Is it yeah. over a constitutional attention to constitutional issues? I, I fundamentally think that she's made a mistake with uh, Richard, uh, Richard <laughs> Wolf. I, I, I just think it's a tactical error. There's nothing wrong with him, the guy. I've never met him. I'm familiar with his work. He's a Marxist, okay? And I think that puts us in a vulnerable position, okay? I am not a Marxist. I had a lot of... Um, Wisconsin and Northern Illinois socialism, okay? I met, had a wonderful talk with Frank Zeidler. How, how many of you, you know Frank Zeidler? Mayor, mayor of, of Milwaukee for two terms, a one, wonderful guy. Here's, here's, here's a trivia question. Between 1910 and 1960, those 50 years, how many years was there not a socialist as mayor of, uh, of uh, Milwaukee? The answer is 12. 38 of those 50 years, the mayor of Milwaukee was a socialist. Okay. Now, these were German socialists. They weren't real screwball types. They're the kind of men who went home to their wives you know, at night, you know, that kind of thing. But 
you know, it was socialism. And they owned the power company and they owned the transportation company. They sold a product called melorganite. You ever heard of melorganite? My father used to use it. Everybody in the Midwest used it. They took the sewage and they treated it, not very much, <laughs> put it in bags and sold it all over the Midwest as fertilizer. Now, it, was, it was a socialist business, you know. So I'm not opposed to that kind of democratic socialism. But Marxism is a wholly different kettle of fish. And I, I'm not, I promised myself I wouldn't get into academic kind of stuff, but. Your time, it's really a couple of yeah, OK. I'll, I'll just finish this question quickly. I am a great believer in the other dialectic, which is the classical dialectic, the idealist dialectic of uh, Plato, Kant, and Hegel, not the material dialectic of Feuerbach and Marx. Jeff. Yeah, my question to you is, as a candidate, as a working class person and as a student, I notice a lot of presidential candidates look down you know, no offense to the academics, they look down at other people as, not as their equals, but below them. Yeah. Now, as a working class person, I've heard from my fellow working class people, especially in my own firehouse, Yeah. they're supporting that you-know-who guy. Yeah, I know. There. I, I know. Said, Why do you support him? I know. Oh, he tells it like it is. I but know. what I'm saying, as a candidate, would you be able to counter this this guy no. and tell like no. this, but from, a, from no. our point of Next view. Next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you said um, the European Parliament was the last resort. What, in your opinion, is the first resort, the second resort, before? What is what, please? The first resort and the second resort. You said European Well, it, it, the it, these kinds of, 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 of incremental changes, oh. like, like the four-year term and getting rid of Section 6 and, and these kinds of incremental changes. There are some middle steps, and that's basically what the Committee on the Constitutional System tried to do. You're wonderful. So I really appreciate it. Before we thank Bill, yes, Gloria. I want to say just some practical things. Is an email with not an original signature sufficient? No, they will take it, and I send it to Jan Martell, okay. and they say, okay. So the other thing is, are, are enrolled Greens allowed to do that for? For more than one. Okay. Yes, you can do it from all. Okay. And I recommend you do it for so all if you to want to. Me, okay. You can send an email directly to Bill saying you support him as a Green Party candidate. That that well to support having me as a as candidate, a Green something Party like candidate. that. Yeah, just as a candidate. As B, B. Okay. Yeah, in the pool, so, whatever. Right. You know. <laughs> so, to okay. have, so people want to have as many candidates as possible. You Thank you. All the candidates. Thank, Thank you, Bill, you so. For Thank you. I, I enjoyed it. This was wonderful. All right. And if anybody, you know. All right, this, this, this was worth the overnight trip on Antrek. <laughs> <laughs>